History is Lunch program. We are working safely with the skeleton crew from our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Next week's History is Lunch will feature our friends Craig Gill and Craig Gill and Sita Srinivasan, who will look back at the first 50 years of the University Press of Mississippi. We're looking forward to that. Today, though, we are delighted to welcome Josh Green to discuss the Prohibition Era Raid of the Jackson Country Club. We scheduled this program in conjunction with the fabulous special exhibit here at the museum's Mississippi Distilled, which looks at prohibition in Mississippi, commonly known as the wettest dry state. Josh Green earned his BA in history and classics from the University of Mississippi, an MA in Southern Studies from the University of Mississippi, and a JD from Tulane University School of Law. His undergraduate honors thesis, The Last Drinking Dries, The Repeal of Prohibition in Mississippi, received the Gray Award for Outstanding Undergraduate Paper in the Field of Southern Studies. Green is a Conservation Lands Coordinator for Ducks Unlimited in Ridgeland. Here's Josh Green. Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, and to everyone out there watching on, on Facebook, I uh, appreciate you tuning in. Um, so the goal of this presentation is uh, pretty simple. It's to talk about this 1966 raid of the Jackson Country Club and how it contributed to the repeal of prohibition. Um, I'm going to uh, start just with a brief, to give everyone kind of an overview of, of what I'm hoping to accomplish. I'll start with a brief history of prohibition, um, as well as some of the prior attempts to repeal it in Mississippi. Um, then we'll jump pretty quickly into the raid itself, um, talking a little bit about what happened on that day of February 4th, 1966. Um, following that, we'll get into uh, some of the consequences of that raid for Prohibition in Mississippi. Um, and really, uh, those consequences uh, were two in-game scenarios that emerged from that raid. Um, one was a legislative in-game scenario, uh, and the other one was judicial. And I'll, I'll spoil the ending a little bit here and let everyone know in advance that the legislature did end up passing an act to repeal prohibition for anyone who wasn't sure about that. Um, but the two very much worked in tandem, and, and I think talking about both will shed some light on exactly how prohibition worked in Mississippi, uh, or depending on your perspective, how it didn't work in Mississippi. Um, and, you know, it's a really fun story, at least I think it's fun, I wouldn't be here talking about it if I didn't think it was. Um, and I certainly hope everyone out there will learn something along the way, but uh, I freely acknowledge that I'm far from the sole authority on this topic. And, and one of my favorite things about giving this talk, and I, again, I have to admit, this is probably the first time I've given this full presentation in about 12 years, so if I'm a bit rusty, you'll have to forgive me. Uh, but one of the things I really enjoy about giving this talk is that I, I feel like I learn something new every time I talk about it. People have their own personal experiences. Many people still have a personal connection to this raid and the story itself, and so I'm um, hoping we'll leave some time at the end for, for questions and then also selfishly maybe a little commentary uh, so that I might be able to learn something too. Uh, so uh, we'll get started. Um, prohibition in Mississippi, very quickly, the statutory origins of prohibition date back to 1907. Um, 1919, this is really just for context, um, the 18th Amendment was ratified, that was national prohibition. Um, 1933, we decided that was a big mistake and ratified the 21st Amendment and repealed national prohibition. Um, that said, a number of states, Mississippi included, decided to soldier on with their state prohibition laws. Um, but over time, uh, those, those states started to, to dwindle, um, and more and more states repealed their prohibition laws. Uh, and Mississippi um, also had its attempts to repeal, and there were four main ones that I just want to briefly touch on. Uh, the first one was in 1934, and so a year after uh, national prohibition was repealed. Um, that was a pretty straightforward attempt. It was a public referendum. The question was, uh, do you want to be wet or do you want to be dry? And in that case, the dry has won a resounding victory. Um, and, and I think <laughs> the extent of their victory probably discouraged any further attempts uh, until 1952, when essentially the same question was put before the public. Um, again, the public voted to remain dry, this time by a slightly narrower margin. It was about a one and a half to one ratio. Uh, the next attempt was uh, 1960, and this was a strange one. Uh, this was one enterprising individual citizen of Mississippi uh, sued the IRS. Um, they had disallowed a tax deduction that he had wanted to claim on his tax return. He said, well, as part of my business, um, I'm routinely expected to buy liquor for some of my clients. And so he wanted to expense that cost on his tax returns. Uh, 
Uh, the tax court, and I think ultimately the U.S. Supreme Court heard this case, and they all said, nope, that's not the case. You can't get a tax break for, for a, an illegal expenditure of money. Um, and so the, the attention that this drew, it's sort of a funny story, um, and so the attention that this drew, again, shed some light on sort of the apparent hypocrisy uh, of Mississippi's prohibition laws. Because uh, on the one hand, you had people that were freely admitting and attempting to claim tax breaks for buying liquor, but on the other hand, liquor was an illegal commodity in Mississippi. And so it provided some impetus for some legislatures to try um, to repeal prohibition again, and in this case, the Mississippi Senate actually passed a local option bill um, that would not require a referendum. But before the House had a chance to move on it, um, a bootlegger shot and killed the sheriff of Marion County, making it politically very challenging uh, to move forward with that. And so that, that attempt more or less died on the vine. Um, and the last attempt came in 1964, so this is only two years before the 1966 raid. Um, and again, this was another referendum that was attempted. Uh, the, the bill that came before Paul Johnson, who was governor at the time, um, essentially put a vote to the public, or the proposal was to allow the public to, to make a decision on two questions. First question, do you want to be wet or do you want to be dry? The second question was, if wet, do you want the state to control the liquor dealers or do you want those to be privately controlled? Paul Johnson never allowed that referendum to happen because there was, as he saw it, uh, it was unfairly skewed towards the wet contingency because you could only vote on part two if you voted wet. And so he saw that as unfair and so that never actually made it to the public. So in addition to, to some of that history about prior repeal attempts, I do want to just briefly put this in uh, broader context of some of the civil rights history that was happening at this time. And this is just a quick list of some of the key events um, starting in 1962, so four years before the raid. There's much more that's not on this list, but I, I put this up here to give everyone a sense of, of what all is going on um, and, and to emphasize uh, the amount of tension that existed uh, and the amount of public focus that had been trained on Mississippi um, and in the nation um, more broadly when it came to issues uh, of racial discrimination. And so, you know, you've got 1962, James Meredith enrolls at the University of Mississippi. 1963 and 1964 uh, saw really important and very well publicized assassinations or murders. Um, 1965, Bloody Sunday, in Alabama, not in Mississippi, but nearby. Then you had the Voting Rights Act in 1966, actually only a few weeks before uh, the raid. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments in the case that would ultimately, a few weeks after the raid, uh, rule poll taxes in state elections unconstitutional. Uh, and so I, I wanted, to put this, this, wanted to put this raid in its broader context as well so everyone had a sense of where it fell within the civil rights timeline. And it also becomes a little, there's an important connection I want to draw a little bit later as well, so I wanted to go ahead and mention it here. So leading up to the raid, what was the public perception of prohibition in Mississippi? So uh, by this point, there were certainly people that, that viewed this idea that Mississippi was the last state with prohibition, and the, Oklahoma repealed their prohibition law in 1959. So by 1966, Mississippi had been the lone standing soldier for six or seven years. And so there was certainly a fairly significant contingent of Mississippi that, that felt that that in and of itself was embarrassing enough. Um, but regardless of which sides you really fell on, there was a general shared sense that the way Mississippi's prohibition laws was func were functioning or not functioning was a, was a public embarrassment. Um, there were a number of national uh, newspapers and magazines that ran articles that, I mean, they poked fun at Mississippi. Uh, and, and this is just a, a clip from a Newsweek article in 1959, but um, New York Times ran pieces, Life Magazine ran pieces, uh, Wall Street Journal ran pieces. I think the Wall Street Journal characterized Mississippi's prohibition laws as a profitable arrangement with its conscience. Um, and so from a PR standpoint, it was, it was a, a public embarrassment for many people. Uh, it was also not great for business. Um, imagine yourself as, as someone who depends heavily on the tourism industry or someone who runs a business that depends on hosting visitors, people who may not be familiar uh, with the intricacies of which county allows liquor, which, which cities don't really enforce these laws. Um, that uncertainty did not 
pr you know, produce a really good business environment. And so um, there was this growing sense that, that something needed to be done to address this. And, and Paul Johnson, on February 2nd, kind of with this backdrop in mind, uh, this is two days before the raid, he delivered a speech. And in that speech, he again urged that it was time to fix this one way or the other. Um, and what he did is he called for a March 15th referendum. Uh, referendums are kind of a running theme in this. Uh, but he called for a March 15th referendum, and it was, the question was, are we going to be wet or are we going to be dry? If we were going to be dry, he was going to ask the legislature for enhanced authority to use the Mississippi Highway Patrol to really truly dry up the state and to enforce the prohibition laws pretty aggressively. Um, if, however, the public decided to go wet, then his, proposals, his proposal was a, a local option proposal where individual counties could vote themselves out from under prohibition um, and there would be a, a, all wholesale sales of liquor would be controlled through a state-owned uh, wholesaler. And, and so this was a fairly big deal. The, there was still controversy um, about uh, both uh, the, the need for a referendum at all, um, and there was also some controversy about whether uh, the state should be setting itself up as the sole wholesaler or if they should leave that to, to the private market. But that controversy aside, this was really the first time that a governor had so publicly put uh, the hypocrisy and the, the embarrassment of the issue front and center in terms of calling for a repeal. Um, and so that, you know, that's February 2nd, so that's two days before the raid itself. And so I think that brings us fairly close enough to actually start talking about what happened on February 4th. So the raid occurred on February 4th. Um, the event itself was actually the reception to the Carnival Ball. Uh, now, the Carnival Ball was one of the social events of the season at the time. It was somewhat akin to a, I guess you could analogize it a little bit to a Mardi Gras ball. There was a king and a queen and all the pageantry associated with that. Um, there was one important distinction, though. Unlike Mardi Gras balls, there was no liquor served at the Carnival Ball itself. However, there was always a reception. I guess that's why you had the reception in the first place. Um, the Carnival Ball was at the King Edward Hotel. The reception this year would be held at the Jackson Country Club. Um, and for years, it was one of the worst kept secrets in the city of Jackson that there would be plenty of liquor and champagne uh, at the reception. Um, but for years, that had never been a problem. Um, again, that had been widely known. No raids had ever occurred. No enforcement actions had really been implemented. Um, and so for many people, there was enough, no reason to expect anything would change. But uh, quite literally speaking, in this case, there was a new sheriff in town. and His name was Tom Shelton. And you can see him... I'm going to try to use this laser pointer. I don't know if it'll show up, but Tom Shelton is the, the far right person in that photo. Um, Tom Shelton was not actually the sheriff of Hines County. Tom Shelton was a deputy sheriff, but he was the acting sheriff of Hines County um, because the actual sheriff, Fred Pickett, was on an indefinite leave of absence. And the reason he was on an indefinite leave of absence was because he was an alcoholic. Um, and you can't make this kind of stuff up. Um, but Shelton himself was a teetotaler, and at the time, whether under Shelton's leadership or under Pickett's previous leadership, um, the Hines County Sheriff's Office had been sort of systematically raiding these poorer roadhouses um, on the periphery of, of the county, outside of the city. And, and that was causing some complaints about discrimination on racial, uh, economic, even geographic lines. Um, and so. Again, going back to one of the slides I had earlier when I mentioned some of the, the tension that had been trained on Mississippi at this time, particularly as it related to issues regarding racial discrimination, um, I have no way of knowing whether Tom Shelton really genuinely cared one way or the other about that, but it's understandable that someone in his position, um, fairly new to this, this job of acting sheriff, wanted to do what he could to avoid any more scrutiny on, on what was now his department. Um, and at the same time, it's understandable that anyone in this position, um, having only been acting sheriff for a couple of months, would, you know, wouldn't mind making kind of a splashy statement um, about, you know, under my leadership, under my control, the Hines County Sheriff's Department is going to function differently. It's a, it's a common refrain that you see very often when there are changes of power. 
And so Shelton decided that uh, he was going to raid uh, the elite, the, the society's elite at one of their most vulnerable moments. And around 7 o'clock p.m. on February 7th, he showed up at the Jackson Country Club and he demanded that he be allowed to search for illegal liquor. And at the time, the only person that was really present was Charles Wood, who was the, uh, the bar manager. So he called the Jackson Country Club president, basically put his hands up and said, I'm not doing anything unless I talk to my boss. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, Tom Shelton was met with this guy. Um, this is Ed Brunini. Um, at the time, he was the president of the Jackson Country Club. Uh, he's a very well-respected attorney within the Jackson community and within the, within the state more broadly. Um, he may have been the managing partner of the Brunini Law Firm at the time. I'm not actually sure about that. Um, but he was a, a politically very well-connected man. Um, and so um, once he showed up, the, those power dynamics sort of shifted, um, where Shelton had previously been dealing with a bar manager. He was now dealing with someone that was far less likely to be intimidated and had no problem uh, rolling the dice a little about getting arrested and feeling confident that he'd be able to get out of it. Um, but by the time Brunini arrived, Shelton and his deputies had already found the champagne. That was fairly easy to find. I guess it must have just been you know, out in the open. But they were still looking for some of the wine and some of the hard liquor. And Shelton demanded that Brunini and the bar manager uh, surrender to key, the key to the bar, which is the logical place that you would, you would think the liquor would be held. Um, Brunini, you know, as accounts have it, essentially told him, we, we did not invite you here, we will not help you. Uh, and so Shelton then proceeded, and his deputies then proceeded, because they couldn't get into the, the bar, proceeded to search basically every other square inch of the country club that didn't have a lock on it. Uh, that included the water tower. For some reason, they were led to believe that the liquor may have been hidden uh, in the, the golf ball water tower. For those of you that are familiar with the country club, it wasn't there. Um, they did decide eventually, correctly so, that it, that it was in the bar. Um, but uh, the problem was is these, these sher the, sher the acting sheriff, Shelton, and his deputies, uh, they showed up to a liquor aid and forgot to, to bring an ax. And so to get into the bar, because Bernini and Wood were refusing to surrender the key, they had to turn around, drive back to the station to get their axes, and then come back. By that time, the partygoers had started to arrive. And stepping back for a second, Shelton's intent here was to get in and get out fairly quickly. Um, he had no intention of making a public scene. He wanted to make a statement, but he didn't really want photographers there. He didn't want the press there. He didn't want his own picture taken, I have to imagine. Um, but that plan had been foiled. By the time he got back with the axe, the partygoers had arrived, and so within full earshot and plain view, Shelton proceeded to axe down the door of the Jackson Country Club bar, um, and his deputies proceeded to haul off um, all of the Country Club, Club's booze. And apparently, some of, you know, some of the accounts I read said that sort of a, a gauntlet kind of naturally formed, uh, and you're talking about carrying out liquor in front of prominent doctors, businessmen, politicians, lawyers, the governor himself was there. Uh, and so it wasn't an ideal scenario for Shelton, but he, he did get the, the liquor. Um, there was only one arrest that he made, though, and it wasn't of Ed Brunini. Uh, so this is the, the arrest report. Um, he arrested poor Charles Wood, the bar manager. And, and this also kind of shows you some of the, you know, they seized 420 bottles of champagne and um, probably a fairly similar number of bottles of, of a variety of different types of hard liquor, uh, 318 bottles of wine. So it was a fair amount of, of liquor. Um, and Charles Wood was the only one who was arrested um, for illegal possession of roughly $10,000 worth of liquor, um, none of which was his, of course, uh, but he sort of bore the brunt of, of Tom Shelton's wrath. So what was the reaction here? So first, this is... I mean, this is fundamentally kind of a funny story. Um, if, you, if, you, if you can remove yourself, you know, if you weren't Charles Wood and you weren't someone who, Shelton, or you weren't someone who was directly involved in this, it's kind of a funny story. And, and so for a lot of people, it really did throw the absurdity of Mississippi's liquor situation directly into their faces. Um, and it highlighted the fact that Mississippi's prohibition laws were very really, you know, very literally a joke. Um, you know, and you had coverage of this raid in... Uh, national publications, the New York Times had, had an article about it, uh, the Chicago Tribune had articles, the LA Times, the Times-Dispatch, not to mention sort of the local papers which ran a number of articles on it. 
Um, and not lost on any of the press was the fact that the governor was present at this raid nearly two days after he had given a speech talking about the need to fix Mississippi's prohibition laws. Um, the second reaction to this was a lawsuit. Uh, State of Mississippi versus Charles Wood. And if there's one thing that I think everyone can take away from this is that if you want to see what the state of Mississippi's most outstanding legal defense team looks like, um, arrest the Jackson Country Club's bartender. Um, it was a pretty formidable group of attorneys that came to Charles Wood's defense, and they sued the state of Mississippi. Um, they essentially got Charles Wood off on procedural grounds, but as part of their, their defense of Charles Wood, they took it a step further and essentially attempted to argue that Mississippi had implicitly repealed its prohibition laws. And their arguments were that the liquor laws were enforced in a discriminatory manner, uh, and so they violated Charles Wood's equal protection rights. Um, it was impossible to convict the violator, so it was a fundamentally unenforceable in practice uh, law, uh, and that the state had implicitly repealed it through active licensing and taxation, licensing of liquor dealers and taxation of an illegal commodity. Um, and, you know, the legal arguments themselves are interesting, um, but what, what was really fascinating from this case was to prove their case, they had to give all of this really fascinating testimony. Um, and so they had district attorneys, they had sheriffs, they had liquor dealers come in and provide testimony about how exactly prohibition functioned in Mississippi. And so that, that's kind of where I want to turn next, is using this, this testimony, talk a little bit about how prohibition actually worked. So prohibition, the black market tax, as it was commonly referred to, um, was first passed in 1944. Um, and it's, it was, it's a little tricky to follow some of these taxes. They changed them and, and passed them, under, put them under new sections over time. But 1944 is sort of the beginning of what the first true black market tax is. And it was a pretty simple tax. It was 10% of the product value on its sale. Um, the state tax collector's office was charged with uh, collecting this tax and enforcing the prohibition laws. Um, and for many years, from 1944 to the mid-1950s, they had collected some taxes, but it wasn't anything you would call a well-oiled machine. And then in 1956, uh, a young up-and-coming uh, Mississippi politician named William Winter was elected to the state tax collector's office. Um, William Winter himself, personally, was against prohibition. He thought it was a silly rule to have in place, and he also recognized that um, the way that it had been enforced in Mississippi uh, was equally embarrassing. And, and so he personally was against prohibition, but he also had a job to do, and that job was to collect this tax. Um, he pretty quickly noted that about half of the state's liquor dealers were, were shirking this tax. And he also recognized that over 90% of the contraband liquor that was coming into the state was coming from our friendly neighbors in, in Louisiana. Um, and the reason for that, we'll go into that on the next slide a little bit, um, had to do with some excise taxes that, that Louisiana had in place. Um, but what William Winter eventually did is he developed a system where he would share information with the Louisiana Department of Revenue to increase the efficiency of this tax collection. And that system was based on uh, stamps. So what the way it worked is that Louisiana had an excise tax exemption for sales of liquor to Mississippi dealers if those Louisiana wholesalers reported the sales to the Louisiana Department of Revenue. So William Winter wanted to get that information, and he wanted to essentially get the Louisiana Department of Revenue to agree to only provide that exemption if Louisiana dealers sold to approved dealers in Mississippi. And from Louisiana's standpoint, that's a great deal because William Winter had the power to shut down that entire business if you wanted to. And so this was a way to ensure that it continued in operation. From Winter's standpoint, it was a way to get a lot more transparency and efficiency injected into the process. And, and what would happen is every bottle of, or every box or crate of booze that came in from Louisiana had one of these stamps. And this stamp basically, <laughs> it guaranteed that the liquor wouldn't be seized. Um, and the system worked beautifully. Uh, and in fact, this is actually skipping ahead a little to 1965. Um, I just found this really interesting. So the, the state of Mississippi, the, the tax commission, who the, it eventually transferred from the tax collector to the tax commission, um, they were even so nice and accommodating that they, they agreed not to, you know, to avoid unwrapping 
Christmas packages of liquor. They, they even went out of their way to say you don't have to actually put the stamp on the bottles of liquor themselves. We'll be nice because we don't want to ruin anyone's Christmas gift, even if it is illegal. Um, and some of the, you had local governments getting in on this action too. So this is a, um, this is a list of some of the, the local tax revenue that was collected from various places in Vicksburg um, that were permitted to serve liquor. Um, and so for the, about half a year, you're looking at almost $25,000, which is not an insignificant chunk of change for, for a local community in Mississippi. Um, so William Winter held this office from 1956 until the, the abolition of the state tax collector's office in 1964. And Winter himself had, had advocated to abolish uh, that office for some time. Um, the issue he had with it was, at the time, st the t state tax collector's office was a commission-based office. So in other words, um, the money that was used to run the state tax collector's office, was a, it was a 10% cut of whatever, the, whatever that tax collector did collect in any given year. And those expenses would be used to cover the cost of operating that office. Um, and Winter and a number of people felt that was sort of a perverse incentive. Um, and ultimately, the legislature did agree with him. Um, they, uh, they did repeal. Uh, the authority from the state tax collector and transferred it to the state tax commission. Um, but by that point, the work was kind of done. Um, the system had been proven to work really well that Winter had set up, um, and it was very lucrative for him. Um, in, in certain years, particularly towards the end of his reign as a state tax collector, um, he made more money than every other public official in the United States America, of America save for the president. Um, and so it was a very lucrative system, that, that, um, that commission-based system. Um, but in 1964, the authority was transferred to the State Tax Commission, and at that time, around that same time, Mississippi got even more complicated. They got even more into passing regulations that were designed to, 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 to regulate liquor as if it were a legal commodity. So you've got the prohibition law at the top, and these are references to the Mississippi Code for anyone who's interested. Um, so you've got a $100, $100 to $500 fine plus some jail time. But then you have far more statutes that govern sales taxes, um, excise taxes. Um, and then at the very end, you've got even a requirement that dealers have permits and licenses to operate within the state. And so you know, the point is that this was very much functioning as a, very, as a legal system. Um, the legislature was doing more and more every year to really normalize this as a perfectly legal business operation. Um, and so here's, you know, here's an application for a business license. Liquor dealers freely put, we are a liquor dealer on the business license, no problem. Um, they would get a permit. Um, and, and, you know, and this is a list that was maintained by the tax commission of, approved, of some of the approved liquor dealers. And you'll notice this is a far cry from the shady bootlegger whose whereabouts are unknown. I mean, this is a, a very transparent uh, business that was going on here. And these liquor dealers were very reliable taxpayers. Uh, in some cases, they were... Uh, they always, almost always cooperated with any kind of inspection or raid. In some cases, they even invited it um, because from their standpoint, it was in their interest to cooperate with the tax commission because the tax commission essentially allowed their business to continue. And this is a, uh, a fiscal report from some of the taxes that, it, that were collected under this system. And if you look at the, I don't know how well you can see that, but the the column to the far left is the 1964 to 1965, and you'll see that uh, revenue from alcoholic beverages was about ten and a half million dollars. Now, I did this is admittedly just kind of googling inflation calculators, but uh, I did some quick adjustments for inflation, and that comes to about 83 million dollars in in terms of today's money. I checked the Mississippi Department of Revenue's 2019. Uh, annual report. And revenues from ABC, the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission, in 2019 were $81 million. And so this functioned for all practical purposes as if it were legal. It is legal now. The amount of money, if you normalize the dollars, was really no different then than it is now. Uh, so with all of that in mind, um, the trial court on April 8th uh, ruled in favor of the defense. Hines County Judge Charles Barber issued a ruling essentially saying that prohibition had in fact been implicitly repealed. Um, 
he stayed that ruling pending an appeal. And this was one of those things where it was quite obvious that an appeal would be filed. Um, but the defense and people who wanted to see Mississippi go wet had their ruling. Um, prohibition was now implicitly repealed. Um, and pending the results of, of the appeals process, um, there was now a risk that if the legislature did not take action, the result would just be wide open sales with no regulation whatsoever. And so that prompted the legislature uh, to do something. So um, shortly after the raid, actually on February 7th, um, Senator Bill Carraway of Leland introduced uh, Senate Bill 1798. And um, that called for a uh, referendum, a public referendum, kind of like we, we've seen on many prior repeal attempts. Um, and it also, so the referendum would have two questions. One question is, do we want to be wet? Do we want to be dry? It had a second question, and that second question was, do we want the state to control the wholesale process here, or do we want to leave that up to private parties? Um, the House got that bill. Um, surprise, surprise, the House didn't really like it, so they decided to pass their, introduce their own bill. Um, it was actually a reintroduction of a bill that had been previously introduced in January 11th, so before the raid, um, by Representative Phil Bryant, no relation to our former governor, I think, um, of Lafayette County. And the House bill did not provide for a referendum. It was just a straight up local option bill. Um, and it provided that the, the wholesale operations would be privately controlled. And moving on to the next slide here. So the legislative history here is actually, it's kind of interesting um, for, for anyone who does want to dive into to some of the, the House and Senate records from this time period. There's some, there's some funny quotes that, that you'll see from time to time about um, things passing the temperance committees uh, with a vote five against and three four. Um, so, so sort of some tongue-in-cheek tongue comments there. Um, but this is, for anyone who is interested, this is kind of a timeline of some of the, some of the key events as, as these bills made their way through the legislative process. Um, but what I want to do right now is bring up this additional text. So these, these things in red, these are some of the key events that happened um, in the judicial process. And even without actually reading through each and every one of these, you, you can see that these were happening very much in tandem and very much at the same time with one another. And some of the legislative response, they, they were playing off of each other, particularly as it related to the legislative activity. As the case moved further and further, um, and it moved further towards what everyone thought was gonna be upholding the trial court's decision, you started to see more movement from the legislature. Um, and ultimately, ultimately the House bill that I mentioned earlier was the one that, that, that made its way uh, to the governor's desk to sign, and that was, uh, that was in, on May 16th is when the bill actually went there. And the bill that did get to his desk, uh, even though it was the House bill, it was really a blend between the two. Um, it was a, a middle ground. So the proposal was that there would be a local option bill, so there would be no public referendum. There would just be a law passed that allowed individual counties to vote themselves out from under prohibition. Um, but the state would, would be the sole wholesaler. And so that was essentially the compromise between the House and the Senate, and that's the bill that actually made it to, uh, to Paul Johnson's desk. Um, but you can see, you know, this thing, you know, litigation has changed a lot since the 1960s, but I think if there are any litigators out there on the call, I think, even, I think they'll acknowledge that even then, having a trial start March 9th, and then the Supreme Court to hear the appeal on that case by May 19th is remarkably fast. Um, this was not capital murder. This was not someone facing significant jail time, but it's pretty amazing how quickly it did move through the courts. And so it gives you a sense of, of, a, of the pressure that, that everyone was under to do something quickly. Um, so ultimately, the, the Supreme Court, so the bill went to Johnson on May 16th. The Supreme Court started hearing arguments on May 19th. Um, but Johnson, on May 21st, beat them to the punch. He ultimately signed the bill that went to him. Um, and he had actually, in April, said that he would sign no bill that did not include a referendum. And so this was a bit of a backtrack from his earlier statement. But 
at the end of the day, this court case and the, the threat of an of a implied repeal with absolutely no regulations or restrictions on the sale of liquor in Mississippi, it forced his hand. And he even said that, or commented when he signed the bill, that the real and present danger of the complete breakdown of enforcement of the present prohibition law in Mississippi caused me to abandon my request for a statewide referendum in favor of this act, which meets almost every requirement I outlined. Um, and so some of you may be wondering what, what happened with the Supreme Court case, because that was still pending. Um, on June 13th, it was reversed and remanded in the most boring possible outcome uh, from a Supreme Court. It's, it's an interesting opinion. It was, it was a unanimous opinion. Um, and the court, essentially, they fundamentally ruled that it's not their place to make that decision. Um, they spent far more time patting themselves on the back for showing such excellent restraint. Um, you could probably, some of the people who are interested could probably quibble with some of the reasoning there. Um, I'll just point out that Mississippi Supreme Court judges um, are also elected officials, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, so what ended up actually happening? So you had, you had this bill. It was a local option bill. Individual counties were allowed to vote themselves out from under prohibition in Mississippi. And so what that sparked was a, a PR campaign um, among the forces of you know, the wets versus the dries. And it was something that, at this point, um, Mississippi was pretty well accustomed to, given the prior referendums that, that put the same issue on the ballot. And so um, I won't go into a ton of the details about exactly um, some, of, some of those arguments, but this is just sort of an example of, of some of the, the political cartoons you saw. Uh, United Drives, Mississippians for Legal Control were sort of, um, they were two organizations that came up fairly frequently as, as being drivers of different sides of this argument. Um, and this, this played out over each county in Mississippi. Um, in counties like Hines, some of the more populated areas, uh, it was, you saw more of it. Um, and in other areas, depending on the political climate of that particular county or city, um, it was really a non-issue because everyone sort of knew which way the vote would go. Um, on August 2nd, Hines County, so the first counties were some of the coast counties. Um, on August 2nd, that's when most of the counties made their decision. That's when Hines County ultimately voted to become wet, along with between 20 and, 20 and 30 other counties, I believe. Um, and so, and, and that's a system that we, until pretty recently, uh, had been in place. Um, individual counties had the option to vote themselves out from under prohibition. Um, I do think in the last few months, if I'm not mistaken, they, they finally flipped that. So uh, the state, so I, I guess in theory, Mississippi did not repeal prohibition until 2020, if you want to think about it from that standpoint. Um, but for all practical purposes, they, they did in 1966. Um, so at this point, I'll, I'll just kind of pause and see if anyone has, has any questions that they want to ask. Um, there are a couple of other things I could get into, some of the, uh, some of the more interesting conspiracy theory-esque aspects of the Country Club raid. Um, but we'll, I'll see if anyone has any questions. First. There, there are some questions. Okay. Uh, Martha Foos asks, is this the trail Mississippi will follow with medical cannabis? I thought about that 12 years ago when I was researching this. I still don't really have an answer. Um, it, wouldn't, it, it wouldn't surprise me to follow something like this. I, I would like to think that um, there are enough people that would understand the history of something like this to, to recognize the, the problems that having something be illegal but also taxing it could create. Um, but, you know, as you saw, there's, there's a fairly significant revenue generating potential um, for, um, for, ta for sin taxing, essentially, if you want to think about it like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it wouldn't surprise me if they did follow this, this chart. I, I hope that they would, uh, hope that they would go a different direction and just and be consistent one way or the other, either have it be legal and tax it or have it be illegal and not worry about it from that standpoint. But it's a good question. Um, yeah. And there are some, there's definitely some parallels there. We have a comment from Lori Neff who says this is making her chuckle. She has a clear memory of her father, a well-known physician, driving to New Orleans only to return with a trunk load of wine and liquor 
He said the trick was to evenly distribute the weight so that the car didn't sag in the back, thus risking the attention of the highway patrol. <laughs> uh, we had a question about, were there other similar high profile raids in other parts of Mississippi? So, I'm not sure, I don't have a lot of details on specifics. I will say that, and this kind of gets into, I'll go ahead and get into it. So, going back to Tom Shelton, and this, this isn't, uh, this probably isn't really adequately addressing the question because it focuses right back in on Hines County, but when Tom Shelton uh, took over the position of acting uh, sheriff of Hines County, he made it known to a number of the, the prominent social clubs in the area that he was actually going to start cracking down. Um, and so many of those clubs took uh, precaution and, and ordered some of their members to clear out their lockers. Um, Ed Bernini did the same thing. He ordered everyone, all of the lockers, to be cleared out of any liquor. Um, that's why it is kind of interesting to me, and it raises some questions as to why. And Shelton did follow through on that promise. He did make raids, um, maybe not on the clubs like he, he said he would, but he certainly followed through with making raids, and so that was publicized. People knew that he was taking some action. And so it, is, it does seem odd to me that um, despite that clear threat and that clear risk, um, the country club still ended up allowing itself to serve as a reception for something that everyone knew was going to be an event where, where liquor was served. Um, but as far as whether there were other high-profile raids in other parts of the state, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Was Tom Shelton a Jackson native? What was his background? He... Uh, either wasn't really inclined to be interviewed that much or the press didn't have much interest in talking to him. Um, there wasn't much I was able to dig up about him just from sort of the public records. Um, so I'm not sure if he was a Jackson native. Um, I know he was a teetotaler. Um, that's about it. He, <laughs> he actually did end up running for uh, the sheriff's office in 1967, the year after the raid. And in his words, he got the fire beat out of him, um, which I guess shouldn't be surprising. Sarah Campbell asks, what happened at the reception after the liquor was taken? Um, I believe what happened is, is the party goers remained and had a nice evening drinking Catawba grape juice, or sparkling grape juice, I think. <laughs> uh, Wendy Allard asks, did you say Hines County was the first county to vote to allow? How soon did the coastal counties follow? I noticed several legal distributors on the list from the coast. Right, so it was... Um, I may have misstated that Harrison and Washington counties were the first. Um, and they, they voted out from under prohibition a few days before that August, 7th, August 2nd date, which is when Hines County and many more counties did it. So some of the coastal counties beat everyone else to the punch by a few days, but then the bulk of the counties had their vote and made their decision on August 2nd, and Hines County was one of those. So yeah, you're, if, you, if you think about it, it makes sense. The counties along the Mississippi River, the counties along the Gulf Coast, and the counties that were um, fairly urban in nature voted themselves out from under prohibition fairly quickly. Yeah. Uh, a question about Sheriff Pickett. Did Sheriff Pickett ever return to law enforcement? It's a good question. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, and then someone had asked. You had mentioned news articles. Were there uh, any editorials that you found uh, published about the Jackson Country Club raid? Nothing that's nothing more than, than kind of your standard editorial that may have mentioned it um, as part of a larger argument for or against uh, repealing prohibition or otherwise addressing the issue. Um, but I, I don't recall seeing any, any really in-depth editorials that were published about the raid itself. Um, at least at least detached from a larger comment or a larger argument for or in favor of prohibition in one way or the other. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that all of this was happening in the context of the civil rights movement. Were the claims of discriminatory enforcement along race lines or was it class-based? I think it was probably both. And you could even throw geography in there to the extent that that's somehow detached from those other two. Mm -hmm. um, the The complaint was that you know, the Hines County Sheriff's Office was only picking the low-hanging fruit, and they were, they were targeting the poorer roadhouses, uh, roadhouses that were on the periphery of the city, and roadhouses that weren't frequented by the elite white citizenry of Jackson. And so it was sort of a, a combination of all of those things, I think. Uh, and then a question about what was the social reaction in Jackson to the Country Club raid, or 
the reaction amongst it in a, in a sense it, it it achieved the effect that Tom Shelton intended um, there was genuine shock that this could happen um, part of that's probably a little bit of hubris sort of the the elite of, of capital city society thinking that they were sort of exempt from this and immune from any sort of attack and so there was a general shock about it and and the fact that you had the governor present you had the lieutenant governor present you had lots of very prominent individuals that were present at this raid um, it did send some shock waves locally throughout the community um, how long those shock waves lasted I'm not sure I think most people now when they tell the story or they remember the story they, they think about it with a lot of humor um, and because it is it is a funny story but yeah. But in the in the present, yeah, it was a it was a fairly shocking development, I would say. Um, let's see. How did William Winter establish the relationship with Louisiana's officials? As far as the exact details of how he established those relationships, um, I'm not sure. Maybe someone who's who's familiar with. Uh, inner workings of state tax offices can shed some light on that, but I have to imagine there's maybe some just a shared sense of camaraderie between one state tax office and, and another state's yeah. tax office. I mean, trade between Mississippi and Louisiana was not uncommon, and so I have to imagine those two offices communicated fairly regularly on a host of other issues, and, and so I'm sure those, those relationships developed somewhat organically, um, yeah. although there may be something that I'm not aware of, some specific end that he had um, that may not be apparent. This is a related question from, uh, oops, from Claire Horn. Did you get to talk to William Winter about his experiences with the tax? I did. Um, that was one of the really exciting parts of doing this research is I got to spend some time with William Winter um, to talk both about his, his role as tax collector and about the raid itself. Um, and he freely acknowledged that it was a very successful and a very lucrative system for him um, but was adamant from, from the get-go that he, he really didn't like the way that it was structured. He didn't like prohibition as the state policy of Mississippi. Um, and I think the, the research that I was able to, to get my hands on and some of the literature that I was able to review, it supports that statement for the most part. I mean, yes, he certainly made a fair amount of money uh, in this role, but uh, it does seem like he genuinely wanted to, to abolish that position or at least cut out the, the commission-based component of, of how his office was paid and how he personally was paid. Uh, and so, yeah, that was, that was a really fun part of this, is getting to talk to, to William Winter about that. Did you have a connection with this story? How did you come to take up this history? So uh, my connection, I'm glad you asked that question. I'll, I'll give a quick shout out here to uh, Richard Dorch, who recently passed away within the last year, I believe, uh, last year or two. So he um, was a former attorney at the Brunini Law Firm and I had known him for a number of years and throughout college, high school, stayed in touch with him and we were having lunch one day and he told me this story and I'm, I grew up in Madison but it was the first time I'd ever heard this story and I thought it was fascinating. Um, and the reason he knew it so well is when, when he was a young attorney at the Brunini Law Firm, he got a call on February 4th from Ed Brunini telling him to come to the country club with bail money in hand because he had a feeling he would be arrested that night. And so Richard Dorch's task for that evening as a young lawyer was to follow around Ed Bernini throughout the course of this, the, the evening's events. And so he had a firsthand eyewitness account of everything that went on. And so that was, that was my connection and my, my end to the story itself. And then from there, I started doing some more research into to what may have been written about it before. And there, was, there had been a previous uh, master's thesis written by a gentleman, Clayton Allen Sledge, I believe was his name, um, that did a lot of really good work on evaluating some of the legislative history as well as some of the political maneuvering that Paul Johnson was able to do in support of this. But it really didn't focus that much on the raid itself. It certainly mentioned it. I don't think you can talk about the repeal of prohibition in Mississippi without talking about the raid, but that wasn't the focus of his piece. And so uh, this just seemed like the story itself was a lot of fun. Um, I got to talk to a lot of really interesting people. Um, it certainly made reading some of the going through microfilms a lot easier that the stories weren't very dull that was really interesting kind of juicy stuff and so um, so I have to give a lot of credit to, to Richard Dorch here um, he, he was kind of my connection to the story and made a lot of this possible for me at least anything else you want to cover um, I'll mention one thing uh, this is kind of a another just fun tidbit there have been some questions about to what extent um, Ed Brunini or some of the other leadership within the country club 
um, either expected this raid to happen, maybe invited it, maybe manipulated Shelton into to hitting them. Um, I'll say that there is nothing but circumstantial evidence to support that. There is nothing I've been able to find that actually corroborates that. Um, but it's, it is an interesting, if you look at some of the timing of the events, um, it is an interesting question to ask in terms of, you know, on the one hand, he'd ordered everyone to clear out their lockers, but then still allowed this event to happen. Um, some of the people I interviewed, William Winter included, strongly suggest that he at least had advance notice of this raid. Um, some people went a step further and said he may have leaked information to invite the raid, um, but that's all kind of conspiracy theory speculative stuff. But it makes the story a little it, even more fun, I think. Yeah. Uh, Nan, we have the axe. Is that right? On this one. The sign, right, the sign for. So if, if our viewers have not yet taken advantage of the opportunity to come and see the Mississippi Distilled exhibit, uh, you should fix that. Uh, it's a great exhibit that looks at prohibition in the state. It's on the second floor of the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum complex. Uh, come down and take a look at that. I hope that you'll tune back in next week as well when we'll have our friends from University Press talking about the first 50 years of that organization and what all has happened there. Josh, thank you so much for this. It is a fascinating story that I have heard many times. There are always new wrinkles that you hear about. Um, we appreciate you coming and talking to us about this. Thank you.